Hello. In this video, I hope to start a discussion about the real costs of software piracy. There are various points here that I would like to address, and I'm just going to go through them point by point in no particular order. I imagine that this video could be fairly divisive, and some people will be very ingrained in one position or the other, so if there is a discussion that starts here, I would like it to be as civil as possible and refrain from insulting each other and just try to keep things professional. The first thing that I would like to say is that whether or not you're a professional or a hobbyist, I genuinely think that you should be investing in the tools that you need to further your creativity. There are also a lot of free plugins and even free DAWs out there, or there are inexpensive DAWs like Reaper, which probably has everything that you could need to fully produce an album. As long as you have the knowledge and the experience, you can certainly do that. One of the popular rationalizations for software piracy seems to be that it, it's a victimless crime, or people will try to rationalize it and say, when I'm making money from my music, then I'll pay for the software that I'm using to make the music. Personally, I feel like this is a pretty weak rationalization. It's a bit like somebody who wants to learn how to play the guitar, and they go to a guitar shop, and they steal a guitar, and they take it away, and they start trying to learn to play the guitar, and their rationalization for stealing the guitar was, oh, when I learn to play the guitar and I'm making money from my guitar playing, then I'll go back to the music store and I will pay for the guitar. It's a, it's a weak rationalization, really. The first group who suffer as a result of software piracy, I would say, would be very small developers, small development teams that maybe consist of a handful of people or even one or two or one person. And those people have invested a significant amount of time and energy into creating a useful tool for people. And often within a couple of days of that software being released into the wild, Kraken groups have basically ripped it off. And in most instances, those companies are not selling their products at a a really high premium. They're usually discounted when they first release and then on top of that smaller developers tend to have more reasonable pricing in the first place just to try and get a foothold in the market. So when a Kraken group basically pulls the rug out from under them days after release then you know that could be really financially damaging to a company. I mean it doesn't matter if they're a big company or a small company, it's still wrong, but you could be really, really harming people, especially when they're a smaller company. And those people deserve to be able to put food on their tables, to feed their families, to enjoy their lives, to enjoy the fruits of their labor. And, um, you know, it comes back to another thing of, if you're making music using these tools and you're not paying for these tools, then putting your music out there, but you're expecting people to pay for your music, you know, it's a sort of a vicious circle where nobody wants to pay for anything and everybody has this attitude of like, why should they pay for things? And it really, it's not healthy. One of the things that's been happening as well, and I think it's a direct result of software piracy, is that you see a lot more of the popular companies moving towards subscription models. And while there's nothing wrong with subscription models, I think they can be a really valid and valuable way to deliver products to your users. I do feel like too many subscriptions might be very off-putting for people, you know, one, maybe two, but when more and more developers all start moving towards subscriptions, it starts to become prohibitively expensive for people and that can lose its attraction quite quickly I would say. One of the cool things about a subscription based plan though is 
But as long as the companies are adding more software to the package, then the value proposition of it keeps increasing, which is one of the pluses of it. It also means that it's very difficult for Kraken groups to to keep up with. I also think that subscription models tend to win over people who maybe were a part in software because it was convenient, but the entry level of a subscription model is low enough that people are happy to get on board and stay on board as long as value keeps being added. The downside of subscriptions tends to be that once a company goes the subscription route, then you tend to see less sales and less incentive to have sales because the subscription is the main focus from that point on. Another thing that I've wondered about is often these days when software is initially released, it can tend to be pretty buggy. And I sort of wonder if that's intentional, that basically companies will release a piece of software that is a little bit less stable or buggy than it should be, and they know that it's going to be cracked within days. So they release that sort of almost beta software that hasn't fully been patched and isn't completely stable. And then a few weeks down the line, they start releasing bug fixes and they're basically doubling or tripling the effort that the parts have to make to get a stable version of the software. And while I can understand why a company might do that, it's also not a great look for paying customers who sort of feel like they bought a piece of software that isn't as stable as it could be or isn't as polished as an experience as it could be. Another thing that I've noticed happening more and more is that certain companies are being bought up by venture capital firms. And generally this is not a good thing. You tend to see the support become significantly worse. Sometimes the venture capital firms force changes on those companies that are not good for the customers and not good for the company or the reputation of the company. An example of that that I'm dealing with at the minute is with BFD Drums where F Expansion sold BFD drums to In Music. The original programmers are still working on it, but they're having continual problems with the authorization methods. And the old authorization method was fine. You authorized it to your machine. It was offline and it just worked. The new authoriz- authorization method is the first iteration was always online. So if you lost connection for at all while you were working on your projects, then all of your software would just just become disabled and all the expansions and everything would would just deactivate, which made it pretty unusable. And then they've been trying to update it to basically solve that so that it only needs to connect every 30 days or every 90 days or people are still reporting that even though it's supposed to be 90 days, after 30 days it seems to just deactivate. And then the only way that you know that it's deactivated is if you keep checking the license manager or you open up a project that's using BFD and there's no drums. So that's a good example of a bad practice. Anti-piracy measures should really be invisible to the paying customer. It shouldn't inconvenience the person that's paid for the software at all. And sticking on to the subject of always online anti-piracy solutions, software protection, you've got I lock cloud, so say the likes of the uh, Sleep Digital All Access Pass, if you don't have an I lock dongle, which I know a lot of people hate, um, and a lot of people say that they'll never buy I lock software if it requires the dongle. Personally, I don't mind the dongle. I think it's a much more reliable method than, say, the cloud. The machine authorizations are pretty cool as well. I don't mind them at all. I preferred if the machine authorizations were the main way and that they would refresh maybe once a month or every 90 days or something. And that way you could remotely deactivate your software licenses that were, you know, on a lost machine or whatever. But yeah, the iLock Cloud requires an always online connection for the activation, which has been pretty flaky from what I've observed. I don't use it and I haven't used it. Um, but I've seen a lot of people having issues with it because of 
outages with iLock Cloud and basically it seems pretty inconvenient. So if you're needing your system to be totally reliable and you're using iLock based software, I would recommend just biting the bullet and picking up a an iLock dongle. This next point may be quite divisive or even seen as controversial to say, but a company like Waves, I think, almost encourages people who have paid for the Waves licenses to certain software to pirate the software because of the Waves update plan. If you're not aware, when you buy Waves software, it comes with one year of the WAP or Waves update plan. And when that runs out, say your your Mac updates the latest Mac OS or you move to M1 Apple Silicon and you're not using Intel anymore, then you suddenly find that your Waves plugins no longer work and that all those twenty nine ninety nine sales that they were having and you were thinking, oh, this is great value, all of a sudden you realize that you have to pay extra basically more than you paid for the plugins in order to continue to use the plugins. So I think in that sense, locking those compatibility updates, they're the only company that I know of that does that, um, but locking those compatibility updates behind a paywall, I think they're actually encouraging people who have paid for their software to go and download the pirated versions just to be able to continue to use the software that they paid for, which personally think is crazy. I have a bunch of Wave stuff. I'm not prepared to do that personally, so I've just left Waves behind. Another major downside of software piracy is that when you download cracked software, you don't know what you're going to get. So you could get any kind of viruses. You could get ransomware that just completely encrypts your whole computer and everything on your network drives and external drives and basically holds everything on your computer hostage, forces you to lose everything by reformatting unless you're willing to pay whatever Bitcoin to whoever it is, or you end up with a cracked version of software that has a Bitcoin mining software built into it. So not only is it decimating your computer's performance, you're actually earning money for criminals by using the cracked software. Or you could end up with key loggers that steal your personal information and passwords and all that kind of stuff. Or you could end up with Trojan horses that are just, you know, basically using your computer as part of some botnet and criminal activity. So, I mean, it's it's a bit of a gamble. You could end up completely corrupting your operating system and having to reinstall everything from scratch. The other thing about cracked software releases tends to be that they're very buggy and unstable and they tend to cause a lot of crashes and things like that. Generally, it's not really worth it. There's so many free pieces of software out there, inexpensive DAWs, free DAWs, tons of free plugins. Some of them are excellent, really, really high quality. I'll see if I can find a list of all the free plugins that are available, and uh, I'll post it in the description below. I know that this subject can be pretty divisive, and I was a little bit wary about discussing it, but it's something that's been on my mind for a while, so I thought it would be good to start this discussion. And in terms of software piracy, I think that if you're really serious about making music, then you should pay for the tools that you're using. If you can't afford them, there are tons of free alternatives out there, free plugins, free software, as I've said. I'll try and put links in the description below. And there are tons of sales, like literally every day I'm getting emails about sales and plugins and offers and we've got Black Friday coming up. And uh, when new plugins come out, they tend to be discounted early bird prices, that kind of thing. Most companies have sort of sales once or twice a year, summer, Black Friday, Christmas. So if you're patient, you can usually pick stuff up pretty inexpensively. And yeah, I'd just like to appeal to people in the comments below. If you're discussing this, please be kind to each other. Don't be antagonistic. I'd appreciate that. Cheers.